Hello and welcome into chat room. Tony Merriman is a professor in the biochemistry department, School of Medical Sciences at the University of Otago. He's also an associate investigator at the Morris Wilkins Centre for Molecular Diversity. His research takes a genetic approach to understanding the biology of human disease. Today, he's going to help us work through something that has troubled society for quite a while. What is the relationship between sugary drinks, fast food and obesity? Professor Merriman, welcome along. Thank you. One in three New Zealanders is obese. That's really a pretty frightening statistic, isn't it? Yeah, yes, it certainly <laughs> is. How did we arrive at this figure? Well, there's clearly a change in the environment. There hasn't been a, a change in, in genetics. And one of the uh, big um, suspects, if you like, and I think there are many things that we, ha we don't even know about yet, is food, is the change in our food supply from um, you know, nutritious whole food that so you and I grew up on, and um, now food supply dominated by um, processed food from supermarkets, but also cheap accessible food from fast food outlets is, is a big factor in it. One of the interesting things I think about is the way we arrive at the word obesity. What, how big do you have to be to be called obese? Well, it, it is, it's um, quantitated or, or calculated, by, if you like, by body mass index, which is a ratio between your weight and your height. And, and you know, a so-called BMI of 30 or above 30, you're classified as obese. Between 25 and 30, you're overweight, and you, you aim to be less than 25. So um, 30 is the cutoff, but there's a lot of people that are quite a bit higher than that, you know, mm. 40, 50 and morbidly obese. Is that BMI, is that quite an accurate way of measuring how big we are or is there well, some there, discussion about that? There, there are a number of ways of doing it and um, some, you know, waist to hip ratio is another one um, because, you know, it's one thing to have fat but where that fat is is important. So if mm. it's around your waist and hips, it's termed, um, you know, it's around your internal organs, it's not as good fat to have around there. Um, abdominal obesity is what it's called, so that's one measure um, as well. One of the easiest ways to talk about obesity is say, you eat too much. If you cut down the amount of food you eat, you won't be so big. Hmm. Pretty simple, isn't it, really? Pretty simple. But, <laughs> but, but really difficult to achieve for many, many people. It is, and, and, and that's, you know, when we start understanding about the biology, you know, um, you know, you see, you know, society has this judgment, very judgmental attitude towards obesity. It's very stigmatised, which is kind of unusual, um, why it should be so stigmatised, and it's about that. Well, eat less, exercise more, but it simply doesn't work like that. No. New Zealand obesity, are we on par with other developed parts of the world, or are you higher or lower than other? We're, we're on par, you know, I th you know, depending on what statistics you look at, we're in the top 10 or top 20 countries, depending on where you source them from, so we're definitely on par. And, mm. and, and, and you know, if you look at some of the, um, the, the global burden of disease, it's an it's a international research data gathering um, organisation looked at obesity and I was involved in that and published a paper a couple of years ago in um, New Zealand. I, I can't recall exactly but it's around about in the 20s but the top ones are a lot of Pacific Island nations. Mm. Did you come up with a reason for that or did you just look at how big different countries were? Well, you, you, you simply gathered data and, and um, determined, you know, average BMIs and then ranked countries. So it's a data yeah. collection, which is really important for, pu um, for policy mm -hmm. development to have good data like that. And now you're going to take that one step further, hopefully, and have a look at the genetic build-up mm. of people and whether that's got anything to do with the disposition yeah. to put on weight. Yeah. And, and we know it's genetic. And, you know, for instance, height is genetic, right? Yes. And, and you were Tall parents, taller children. Yeah, and you, you probably <laughs> judged me and thought I had short appearance, right? Yes, I did. So, 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 <laughs> <laughs> so, so if you look at a group of people and, you know, say a group of men, you know, European men, they'll differ in height. And what we do know is that 80% of the reason why those men differ in height is due to genes. Okay, it varies. Um, 
Also what we know is, is if those men grew up 200 years ago, we'd all be on average lower, but we'd still have the same reasons for differing in height. Mm. And it's the same with obesity. 60% Six, of the reason why some people get obese and others peop other people don't in a given place at a given time is genes. So we know it's genetic. And um, from overseas populations, we're also getting some um, very good uh, overseas studies, some good ideas about what those genes do. So if you've got big appearance, yep. you ha will have a disposition to be a bigger person. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. No matter... Even if you watch your food intake, you do your exercise, you, you've just got to watch it more carefully to keep, yeah, yeah, keep yeah. smaller. Um, and, and we know that um, some of the, the, the genes involved in obesity, and this is from overseas populations, you know, control how much fat you deposit compared to someone else. You just might de deposit more fat. Um, but one of the um, in very interesting in, um, areas is that it's about controlling your appetite. So somebody who, you know, one important biological f pathway, if you like, in obesity is people just feel hungrier and mm. they eat more so they don't feel hungry. Mm. And in an environment where food is everywhere, um, you get um, conditioned to eating more, bigger portion sizes, so you're feeling hungry. So you go back for seconds and thirds. Whereas people who may not um, have a, 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 that biological tendency might have not go back for seconds and thirds. So jumping a long way ahead, if the study that you're running now shows that obesity is a genetic makeup, mm. is there a pill then that could well, keep us thinner? Well, I know that, 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 that's, that, that's a, jumping an awful well, long way That's a really ahead. interesting question because there's a lot of um, you know, discussion about how we deal with obesity. So it's very much a public health problem here at the moment. You know, and public health are struggling to tackle obesity because um, there are many different causes including differences in people's biology. So what, what we may would hope to find is that we do a genetic study and we can stratify people into differ, differing primary causes, you know, pick out groups, and those groups might benefit from different approaches. Some might benefit from a pill, right? You know, living in this environment, it's too hard to change behaviour. Here's a pill to stop you feeling as hungry. Or some others might benefit, and we already know this in overseas study, that's a particular gene where you can, if you have a particular type of this gene, you benefit more from exercise. So you might target those people with exercise. So it's all about um, t using the genetic information and stratifying people and sort of personalising, if you like, into, um, a pro you know, it might be medical interventions or, or lifestyle interventions that are more likely to work in those people. My guest on chat room is Professor Tony Merriman. We'll take a break and when we come back, we'll look at the link between obesity and diabetes. Welcome back to chat room. My guest is Professor Tony Merriman from the biochemistry department at the School of Medical Sciences, the University of Otago. We're looking at obesity today and this time we look at the link between obesity and diabetes. Is there a firmly developed link between those two? Yes, yes. I mean, obesity is a risk factor for diabetes, and not only diabetes, but heart disease, gout, um, and this constellation of diseases we call a metabolic syndrome, you know, high lipid levels. So with diabetes, it increases your chance of being insulin resistant, and that's the first stage in, in development of diabetes type 2. So that's the adult type 2 diabetes as to... Mm distinguish it from the childhood type 1, which is a com quite a different cause. So with diabetes type 2, a better diet, less weight, could definitely help It could control. definitely help, definitely help diabetes, but there are a lot of lean people who have type 2 diabetes. That's what I thought, yeah. 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 So it, the link is definitely there, yeah. but it's not absolute. It's, oh, definitely not. No. It's a risk factor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Let's have a look at the study that you're carrying out now that you're part of. It's quite a big study. This is a study into how genetic buildup and, and you can control your food intake and that, that will help uh, control uh, your, um, the, how big you get and how obese you get. When did the study start? So, so the study is really um, more focused just on understanding the genetic basis of 
diabetes and obesity in New Zealand, Maori and Pacific population. Okay. It really has a strong genetic focus, so we're not doing any behavioural um, interventions or anything like that. We're taking um, so that study started last year, and what what we're doing is we're taking um, 200 Maori and Pacific people who are, you know, very obese. Um, we're taking 200 Maori and Pacific people who develop type 2 diabetes at a young age, so this is less than 35, and 200 Maori and Pacific comparison people who are older, lean, without diabetes. And we're going to um, target specifically look at a subset of the genes, ones that we already know from overseas studies are important in diabetes, and we're going to study those genes really closely. And what we um, would actually be looking for are genetic variants that are unique to pretty much unique to Maori and Pacific to Polynesian in other words and if these genetic variants are related or associated with diabetes and obesity we might be able to um, get a better understanding about interventions that will work best mm. in, in um, subsets of people. Has this type of study been carried out overseas on Different nationalities. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, we're we're um, dragging the chain there a bit in New Zealand on um, on doing these sort of studies with Maori and Pacific people, you know. And I've been doing that for a number of years in Gout, you know. Um, but now we're just starting with the Morris Wilkin Centre to get going um, with Maori and Pacific. It's been done in Europeans, Asians, Africans, lots of different populations overseas. And what's been the outcome of the studies overseas? Can they find that link? Well, you, you're starting to find though, though, um, genes like that that provide not in the entire population, but in a subset, you know, and it might be one gene will define three to four percent, and that's all we're talking, that's not the entire, but it's a subset where you can say in, in type two, there was an interesting study done in Greenland where they found a gene or genetic variant that was pretty much unique to Greenland, mm -hmm. but that gene operated in a pathway where individuals who had it put them on insulin, you know, early on in the piece and they might respond. Even when they it. weren't showing yeah. signs of yeah. diabetes. So you know, so rather than, you know, doing the diet, exercise and other approaches, it might yep. be that the, these guys are going to benefit, these people benefit from insulin earlier yep. rather than later. Yeah. And that's a, um, will hopefully change clinical practice over there. Um, if your study did come up with a result that there was a gene that was identifiable in people who were susceptible to obesity. Mm. What could you do with that? Well, um, it depends entirely on where that gene operates in your body. If it's a gene controlling appetite, um, that would tell you something about the cause of obesity in that individual. But mm. maybe you mm. could design a medical intervention, right? Um, you know, it might be a gene that you could target with a drug to suppress, you know, for instance, if it's a gene that makes you feel hungry, even when you've eaten, you know, and you still have these hunger pangs, um, it might work to um, suppress those or stop them. And that would stop your, um, would s suppress your hunger pangs and means you wouldn't eat as much and hopefully deal with the obesity. You know, it's yeah. hypothetical, but... Um, yeah, yeah. But that's... Uh, it's you know, kind of where it could go, I, I, dependent I upon the result of the study. That's right, and um, and I and I think that's the you know an important approach. It's not the only approach, but I call it medicalising the condition. You know, rather than um, you know dealing with obesity and this advice to eat less and exercise more, which isn't working. You know, in, in New Zealand or anywhere else, um, we need to take, <coughs> in addition to carrying on with the public health approaches, which are absolutely necessary, um, we need to medicalise it. Where is the study up to? Have you have you got your panel, or are you we working on it now? Just got the panel of individuals, and um, mostly recruited from Auckland. Um, certainly, the type people with type two diabetes that's just been completed, and now we've nearly got our um, what we call our gene set together, where we've designed the um, what genes we're going to look at, yeah. and so in the next couple of months, I think we'll hopefully be sending the. Um, DNA for the for the actual sequencing, and we probably will use New Zealand Genomics Limited. And I should put a plug in for them; they they um, sponsor my visit up here. But um, but we will use them. They're a local company, New Zealand Inc. type of company, and um, probably use them. And then hopefully by the end of the year or early next year, we'll have the be able to start analysing. And 
That's quite quick for a study of this nature, isn't it? If, if you could get something back of substance early next year? Yeah, yeah I suppose, you know. You know I always like to be conservative as well, but the, the, the biggest part of it is actually recruiting people. Yes. It's, it's not easy. Yeah, you needed about, what, 600 people of the yes. various types and yes, yes. categories. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That, that very time consuming. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. What, do, you, do you have a feeling about what's going to come out of the study? Well, I do have a feeling because we've, you know, we, we've already done an experiment like this in gout, okay, and um, and we just threw in one or two um, obesity genes in there, and we've got some very interesting, you, you know, um, potentially interesting genetic results coming out of that with with Maori and Pacific. So, and based on overseas studies, um, I do have a a feeling that we will find very very informative genetic variants. My guest on chat room is Professor Tony Merriman. We'll take a break and when we come back, we'll look at the link between obesity, fast food and sugary drinks. Welcome back to chat room. We're in the Napier Library today. If you hear any background noise, well, that's just the normal library use. People are here doing what they do in the library. It's a very, very nice environment. My guest is Tony Merriman, Professor in the Biochemistry Department at the School of Medical Sciences, University of Otago. Tony, we've had a look at diabetes and we've had a look at obesity in New Zealand. More and more we are hearing from around the world that fast food and sugary drinks are the cause of obesity. I'm sure they are part of the cause. Do you agree that oh, yeah. they are causing they more are, obese people. They are part of the cause, but as I, um, I think there are many causes, and um, so you, you know you can think of things like even warm homes. You know, you shiver less where, where, where warmer would be a contributing to obesity. Maybe but there's not been a lot of research done on that. So they're part of the cause, definitely. Mm. I guess <laughs> the lifestyle that we live these days could be another part, particularly children who spend mm. a lot of time indoors computer games and that mm. sort of thing. It's mm. just a more sedentary yeah, lifestyle. That's right, it? and there may even be links between reduced sunshine exposure and obesity and diabetes as well. Where do you sit on sugary drinks? Well, I'm, I, I, um, it, I sit strongly against them because, and I have not only am I a geneticist, but I actually did my um, undergraduate training in biochemistry, so I got taught all about metabolism, and I remember way back in the late 1980s when I was sitting in a lecture um, on metabolism and this was right at the point when we were urged to have fat free and lose weight and then I got taught that sugar gets converted into fat and this is a fact that's well known now so that kind of said to me hey you know um, we're and as it's panned out we've reduced fat in foods and increased sugar gets converted into fat in the liver but sugary drinks are worse and the reason why they're worse is that the sugar's dissolved so you um, and it depends how quickly you drink them if you quick a if you quickly drink a sugary drink it goes in, into your stomach intestine and is quickly absorbed into the liver and the liver can't handle it so the fructose so sugar is in this country is sucrose one part fructose one part glucose the glucose is a good sugar fructose is a bad sugar and it's just converted into fat in the liver. The liver just can't handle it. It's also converted into uric acid as a cause of gout. High levels of uric acid are gout. It also makes the liver insulin resistant diabetes and it also causes bad fats to be made because it gets converted into fat. Your bad fats get made, they get transported around the body, deposited as fat but also clogging up the arteries heart disease and one of the most interesting studies is an Australian one that looked at um, the blood vessels of young adolescents and correlated the narrowness of the blood vessels in the back of their eye um, with the amount of sugary drinks and those young adolescents, it was a 12 to 15 year old, old t um, kids who were drinking more sugary drinks had narrower vessels which an indication of narrowing of the arteries and heart disease later in life. They're not good. Are they? There's nothing good about them, and they're also correlated with weight, you know. And, yeah, and that seems yeah. to be the big thing: mm. sugary drinks and obesity. But we're losing sight of the fact that they're quite bad. You know, probably worse in terms of health, directly causing diabetes, directly affecting gout, and directly affecting heart disease. Mm. Mm. 
Is there an answer to this? Are, are you a great fan of increasing the tax on well, sugary drinks? Yes, 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 because um, they just, there's nothing good about them. There's nothing at all. You know? mm. I'd, I'd say to someone, you know, you've got 10 teaspoons of sugar in that bottle, it's safer just to spoon the sugar, and cheaper probably, to spoon the sugar directly out of a sugar bag, because it will get dissolved slower. Um, <laughs> but um, yes, I am a, a, a firmly supporting a tax. Yeah. The English government have talked strongly about implementing mm. a tax. Our government's run away from it at the moment. Yeah. Um, is the English tax, from what you can understand, will, will that help? Well, it's got the potential not to work because it's, as far as I understand it, it's um, taxing the companies. And I, a tax will only work if the tax is transferred onto consumers. And 10% Probably not enough, I would argue, for something 40 to 50 percent, mm. you know, significant tax mm. to significantly raise the price of these drinks. You know, take the same approach that's been used in cigarettes. Let's have a very quick look at gout now because that's part of your interest area mm. as well. Are more people getting gout nowadays or is it we're just diagnosing it? better and quicker now? No, I think certainly um, people of European ancestry, more people are getting gout and we know that from overseas studies and there are indications here but it's of a particular um, high prevalence in Maori and Pacific people and you know, roughly 6% of Maori people for example and a little bit more Pacific people get gout and that's been the same for decades at least for Maori from the data that's been collected mm. in this country. Is that genetic as well? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah we, we, we actually know Maori were getting gout pre, pre Western westernisation, you know, even before Europeans came. So it has to be a strong genetic component there. Yeah, and back then their diet would have been pretty fruit damn and good. vegetables, wouldn't it, yeah, by pretty and good, large? Pretty good, so that yeah. says genetics. Yeah. And it also says that um, there's no amount of lifestyle change that will stop you know, most Maori getting gout. So the key to it is caused by high levels of uric acid in the blood and Maori and Pacific people naturally have high levels of uric acid. And that's actually a good thing because uric acid, aside from gout, does good things in the body. Um, but you lower it with allopurinol. Right? Um, so getting on allopurinol, it, it's one of the best examples of a disease that can be medically treated and was one of the best examples, certainly at least in Māori and Pacific, that that's really the best approach. Get on allopurinol, lower the uric acid levels. Um, once you're starting allopurinol, it can cause attacks when you're, um, as, your cris as your uric acid crystals are dissolving, they're the ones that cause gout, but get on that allopurinol and stay on it mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting that healthy food doesn't taste as good as fast food. Yeah, no, you, you know, <laughs> that, that, that's a real problem <laughs> for many people. Oh, exactly, you know, and it's the same with me. My kids are exactly the same. You know, mum yeah. and dad, your food, where's, where's the yummy food? Yeah. <laughs> are we going to be able to fix that? that I, I, my, you know, my personal view is that no, not in a hurry. Um, it's biology, right? You know, we like sugar and salt. Yeah. And fat all taste good, um, and and the food supply in my opinion isn't going to change in a hurry so therefore that's why I um, advocate let's take a practical approach and you know get better medical treatments get more wide array of treatments target the treatments better get more medical with um, dealing with gout obesity diabetes and these metabolic diseases we look forward to the results of your study or the study that you're part of could throw up some very interesting well, things we hope so thanks for popping in yeah, welcome. Professor Tony Merriman, my guest in chat room. I must say thanks to the Napier Public Library for having us here today. We don't uh, stop people from doing what they do in the library. We just enjoy being here. It's a great place. Until I'm back in chat room again, do take care and have a good time. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.